and then the product. Uh, I can give you my own experience of talking to surgeons. If you have five surgeons in the room and you ask them for a question, you won't just get five answers, you might get eight or nine answers to the question. So it's very difficult to figure out what kind of product you need by asking the surgeons. And, and I, I say that with sincerity because I understand it's very difficult for them to really imagine what it is that we're, we can do. And so as engineers, we do a very poor job of helping them understand, you know, really where can this go and what is practical and what is sensible and what are the limits and, and so on. And, and uh, so what he says is that um, every started as a grand experiment uh, designed to achieve validated learning. And I thought that was really, really an interesting way to think about your startup. Um, you know, you have limited amounts of money and so you're really running this great experiment. And so what he talks about is the concept of a minimal viable product, an MVP. Um, and, and I'm really simplifying the, the book, but you find early adopters. So if you know the innovation dilemma and the innovation solution, the innovator solution, you know in the story about early adopters. So you find those early adopters. So, and you know, Dr. Invari would be an example of an early adopter. Vision guy, willing to put up with, you know, engineering speak and try to learn what we're talking about and, and you know, help us along and answer the dumb questions that we ask all the time. Um, and he's always an early adopter. So you find a group of those people and you, whenever you're writing a business plan, and you've heard about business plans, you're going to make assumptions in your business plan. What makes sense? What am I selling and why am I selling and who am I selling to? So you have to figure out if you can validate those hypotheses. And so you, run, you find these early adopters that help you validate it and basically you ask yourself these four questions which I thought were really good questions if you're trying to do a startup. Do they recognize they have a problem you were trying to solve? I mean this is one I think that's been alluded to earlier. We frequently, uh, we assume we understand the problem and it's self-evident which is usually only evident to self and you go off and start building a solution and people have not even recognized they had the problem. Uh, so if they, if they recognize they have a problem, do they, is there a solution, would they buy it? In other words, now I have an idea, would you actually buy it? And then would they buy it from us? And then can we build it? And you notice the can we build it comes kind of late in the, in the sequence of questions. So I thought those were really good questions and, uh, you know, to ask yourself in this, in this early process. So, and I've got the, the acronym is BML, not BLM, but uh, you build this minimal viable product and then you run through, when you build this, you run a, through a full, term, a, a full turn of build, measure, and learn. So you build something, you then measure, and then you learn from that, and then you go back to your hypotheses. If you have to, you might change. So the building part, which we all love to do as engineers, so that's the first thing we get into is starting to build, which is uh, great. Uh, but we tend to build very complex things and then we measure. And so what he says is measure, you build something quite simple. So this is this minimal viable product. And he doesn't worry too much about quality actually, because he's not building. This is not the final product. This is just the minimum viable product. And then you measure and he gets, he spends quite a bit of time here because at this point you're thinking, well, this sounds great. I'm going to build a bunch of stuff. I'm going to throw it out in front of them, ask them what they think and you know, I'll change my way or whatever. And he spends a lot of time talking about innovation accounting. And what is it that you actually are measuring? And every time you run one of these little, these little uh, um, BM, BML, pro or BML processes, you've got to have a specific thing you're trying to measure and you've got a specific way that you're going to measure it. It's very rigorous, which is something that, again, we in the engineering world do not do a very good job of. So they have to be actionable metrics, things that you can really measure. And then based on that, you look at, at what you've done and what you've measured and you say, well, am I building the right thing or not? You might make sort of mid-course corrections, which is what most of us hope for, but he talks about, you know, sort of three decisions. Um, you know, am I on the right track? Am I on the wrong track and should I change track? And, or should I just abandon ship and get out of this because it's never going to work? And those are the questions. And he talks about things, this pivoting, which is basically, um, I've got to change. Uh, I, this is a good idea, but I'm doing the wrong thing here. And examples of that are, am I, um, maybe I have the wrong customer in mind. So maybe I'm building this, it's the right thing, but for the wrong customer. Do I need to look at my customer and change that? And he gives lots of examples of that. Or have I got the right idea, but I've got uh, something wrong with the product, so I do, do I need to change the product? So he talks about this as a pivot moment 
And he said, in any startup, you are going to have a series of pivots. And as fast as you can get to those pivots, make the change and move forward is the only hope you have. Because, you know, we talked about uh, going from a startup to a fully functional medical device company. And we put numbers in there of $150 million. And I can, sh I can assure you there's nobody out there right now with checkbooks anxious to write checks for $150 million to finance any of you in building one of these companies. So you're going to be in this startup phase, you're going to be very lean. And the leaner you can be and the quicker you can get to a good answer is the better. So I really, um, I really liked uh, this. I, it gave us a lot of guidance. I know an MDA, being a big corporation, uh, this does not fit in instinctively with the way that we do business, certainly on the space side. So we're actually having lots of discussion right now with our team about how do we implement some of this idea uh, in this medical field. So I, I'll let you know next year how it's, how it's turning out if we're still around. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Finished early. Well, finishing early. Yes, right. Uh, any uh, any questions today? Yes. Oh, Chris, go away. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, not normally. It's not, we don't uh, we don't have open houses or anything like that. I mean, so much of what we do in there is proprietary that you know we, we don't allow cameras or anything like that. But we, we you know what's your specific interest? Uh, yeah. Well, talk to me afterwards. We'll see what we can do. I mean, we certainly love good publicity and we certainly understand we have a responsibility to the public. And just as an aside, you know, we've been, I didn't mention this, but if you looked at all the space robotics we've done, you're talking about billions of dollars worth of generally taxpayers' money. Now, fortunately, a fair bit of it's U.S. taxpayer money, but some of it's Canadian. And I have to say that, you know, when I'm, sit when I'm sitting in the backyard having a beer with my neighbors and tell them what I do and I say, those space stuff, well, it's cool, but, you know, they don't think, well, gee, this is really making a difference to me. When I talk about the medical robotics, and part of the reason why I have such a passion for it is because I think we're taking the investment we made in space and putting it on the earth. And, you know, I fundamentally believe that robotics and other elements that we're doing there are making and will make medical outcomes better for people. So, you know, we owe it to the public to be open and tell us, tell them what to do. So, if, you know, we'll see what we can do for you. Sure. As a surgeon, I feel obligated to comment on, <laughs> on what you said. And actually, I, I agree that this uh, situation, when you ask five surgeons, you get nine answers. This is true. But I believe that this is mainly due to the fact that surgery is a certain kind of art. And I think when you get nine uh, answers, you should feel lucky because uh, then your engineers have uh, the possibility to cover all, all uh, aspects of the problem. It is probably much better than what I've seen se several times where engineers are sitting in, uh, in uh, their own rooms and developing prototypes, uh, but consulting with their own uh, colleagues without uh, surgical input. And surgeons in this case are Sometimes the inventors, and uh, on top of this, they are the end users most times. So it is a great advantage. Well, I, I, thank you for saying that. And I would just say most of the engineers that are, are working on our medical, in our medical products have, you know, we get them into the surgery and see the process as it is now. And it amazes me when I sit and talk to them how much they can do the medical speak as well as the engineering speak. So I, I agree with you. I mean, it wasn't meant as a, as a criticism of surgeons. It's just what I was trying to say was when we get into the space stuff, people, you know, you do a very long, complex way of development where by the time you're really trying to figure out what the requirements are, there's a fair bit of knowledge about what you're trying to do, even though it's never been done before. Whereas in this, first of all, there's not a lot of standardization. And secondly, it's a very dynamic environment. And so it's why on this innovator thing I was talking about, I want to start running experiments early so we can get in front of the surgeon and say, just look at this little piece. This is you know, how you're going to hold the, the device. You know, does this work for you? Or does, you know, does it mean you have to, those kinds of things early rather than 
you know, showing them a working model of something we've spent six or eight months on and, a, you know, half a million dollars. And then he goes, oh, yeah, but the hand controller is in the wrong place, right? So we're trying to, I want to try to break it down into much, much more bite-sized pieces, find the early adopters, try them out, and get the feedback. To, to, because one of the problems you have with robotics, it is that kind of drives it to more of a standardization than, than in, the existing, in the existing world, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you.